Mr. Low Cost to join us. Patrick Murphy, former chairman of Ryanair and advisor to a number of low cost carriers all over the world. Welcome, Patrick. Oh, is that your type of music? <laughs> Well, you know, everybody will get his music now, so I'm looking forward to the next uh, music. It's for a man who is very well in red wine, <laughs> in Russia, airports, and marrying in Denmark and celebrating in Hamburg. We are looking for Daniel Bokhart from Moscow, Domodidovo. I'm not a doctor, but I think I know what you need. So baby, don't be shy, satisfaction. So, and now we go back a little bit to the airport side. Peter Hoslin, huge amount of experience from tourism um, board Hong Kong to airports in the Middle East and in Australia, and now actually back to Europe in Northern Europe, uh, Stockholm's Cluster Airport. Peter, please join us. Thank you. Well, very, very short, but here you are. Um, our next guest, he is um, representing China, and as we heard, industry is moving east. I am very happy to welcome Stefan Pampel, account manager at Hainan Airlines. Thank you. And last not least, we are almost complete. We want to talk about innovation and new ideas. And actually, there is this institution which I learned a lot about when I talked to Kai Plötner. It's called Bauhaus Luftfahrt, and it's all about innovation in a scientific way. Where is he? Kai, can you join us, please? There he is. <laughs> You can go wherever you like. We would actually like to start with an interesting exercise. We are on the green field outside of Hamburg in the countryside. You get one billion dollars, it's your money, and you are going to found, well, for the airports, uh, start a new airport. For the airlines, you start a new airline. And the target is you don't want to lose all of your money. So what are you going to do? What are going to be the key strategic decisions you are going to take? Whom shall we start with? Patrick, you look at me like you already have a clear plan in mind. Yeah, he has already the money, you know. <laughs> <laughs> this is being done I mean, right now and in the Far East, and particularly in China and Japan. That's exactly what's happening. Money is going into airports, money is going into airlines, because it's a business proposition that makes some sense. Yes, they will lose money in the first year or two, but in the long term, they can and should make money. Not all do, but there is a the good prospect of doing it. Now, if you bring it back to the Hamburg situation and the negativity of some of the things happening in Europe, maybe a different matter, but fundamentally, there's good prospects if you do it right. The failures of the most of the European airlines in terms of performance in the past two or three years, it's changing, is directly related to the fact they just cannot get control over costs. They are allowing unions to dictate and demand and fix things to happen. And they cannot get the cost back down. If you want a model to work on, just remember Ryanair is now the biggest airline in Europe, just 20 years in operation, 350 aircraft, 130 million passengers, the most profitable airline, and to 1.5 billion euros in profit in this year expected and <coughs> is making a 23% return. Nobody's in the ballpark of that kind of return. So cost is the key. Structures that follow from that uh, give you the foundation for saying what you need to do. So what exactly are you going to found? I understand you want to go to Asia. Is it going to be a long haul or a short haul carrier? You want to look at costs, so can you just give us like from key, 
four to five key bullet points, what you are going to do with your money? Sure, and I'm not going to go into long haul, low cost operations. <laughs> that is a disaster area. <clears throat> proven by AirAsia X, who have tried it and failed and miserably do it. It's now beginning to make some profit, but it's only now, after six or seven years in operation. Scoot, who are now coming to Europe. I don't know why, but they were a loss making up to now. Uh, but they still intend to expand, like that kind of thing. That doesn't make any sense. And we have the Norwegian, which is just going downwards in performance from the original operation ever since they started doing long haul. So you have to rethink. So don't even contemplate doing long haul. But that doesn't mean you can't expand and we're getting new opportunities created by the manufacturers creating the 737 uh, <coughs> MAX, 800 MAX, creates capabilities of going much longer range and Airbus can take some time for last year's announcement of the A321LR, which is creating a narrow-body aircraft comparable and identical to the A321, and will now go up to eight hours in flight. But it's the same configuration as the existing aircraft. Therefore, there is a new change happening right now, and I think there are opportunities for those who are grabbing it. And certainly, the Japanese will be doing it, and certain airlines over this part of the world will also be doing it. Kai, would you start an airline without aircraft, maybe? We've heard a lot about the move today from physical to digital. What would you do? Um, definitely, I would not, let's say, invest a billion money, uh, let's say, starting an airline, or let's say, starting and operating an aircraft, so to say. So what I would definitely try to do with the money to set up, I mean, it's mentioned all, all the time in the morning here, a kind of platform system where I'm trying to connect, let's say, the people from the door to the airport, from the airport and to the other airport. I mean, this can be easily done, let's say, by an airline. They are, they are specialists in that. And uh, I'm trying, let's say, to, to capture, let's say, the entire travel itinerary and trying to get the contact with the customer from the start to the end and trying to get the information from that. Um, yeah, and focus on that, rather than just operating the aircraft. Daniel, let's move to the airport for a moment. You already seem to have a plan in mind as well. I have a plan in mind, yes, absolutely. Uh, but, but you know that I worked in airlines before, because this That's is where true. we first met. And when, when I left my long years employer, uh, I still haven't been pretty young, after 11 years, um, the chairman visited me in my office <laughs> and uh, he said, I want to wish you all the best for the future. And I hope you won't join another airline, but you won't. But you will join an industry that has a chance to make big percentage of return on investment, which an airline will never be able to do. Ryanair has then shown us that it's possible, but uh, in those days it was not possible. I would actually invest into an airport, Greenfield Airport. Great, great stuff. Um, I would make sure it's not too close to the city center. I would make sure that I don't invest too much into marble and, uh, and fancy stuff, but I would rather um, uh, invest, co-invest ideally, so I can have a bit of control uh, into a fast public transport system, maglev style, I mean something that brings this airport and the closest uh, cities uh, very quickly together. Um, and I would then invest into all the land around the airport because I'm convinced that the profit of the airport industry in five years is impossible to come from charging airlines for landing and taking off and, and processing their passengers. But it comes from everything else you do within your terminal and one day the terminal will be too small. I said something like that last year already on that conference. You need the land around the airport and you have to start thinking about airport cities and Aerotropolises, and I would actually plan my Aerotropolis and then put the airport into the middle with this billion. And it's easy, billion, a billion is enough. So you can build two. <laughs> <laughs> and Daniel, in which uh, continent, on which continent you want this to do is, that? This is difficult to say. Yeah, um, I think so. Uh, yeah, because especially nowadays it's difficult to say because the situation in the world has changed so much in the last four years actually. Um, and um, in Russia, where I live for, for the last uh, almost 20 years, it has changed dramatically. And it was not the positive impact of the Olympic Winter Games, no, it was the negative impact of the occupation of the Crimean Peninsula a day after the Olympic Winter Games in Sochi. Um, and that has then triggered a lot of developments, I believe, in, in the world. Um, so it's very difficult to say 
which part of the world is going where, but we clearly see where we have growth in aviation and uh, we can clearly um, calculate and forecast, of course, uh, where people obtain more passports, where they have more disposable income. One day they will use those two factors to start traveling and traveling differently from today. Um, look at the United States. When you calculate out those who now have, an, have a passport in the United States in order to go where they always went without a passport, Canada, Mexico, and then you have about 7 to 10 percent of the Americans actually having a passport in order to leave this continent. And the other 90 never thought about it before. Huge potential. In Russia, 12 percent of the Russians have a passport. We are talking about more than 150 million people. Mm -hmm. So 12 percent of those, imagine how many more Russians will come and buy the watches in the Swiss uh, duty-free stores. <laughs> yeah? So if I, if I build this airport in Switzerland, I would make sure that I have in my aerotropolis enough watchmaking uh, factories. So it's all, it all depends from, look, uh, Michael, you want to apply for a job in my airport? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Michael looks very happy talking about Switzerland. Um, no, I couldn't say now where it would be, but the, the, the principle is the same everywhere. And we see it everywhere. Uh, we see it less in Europe. We don't see much of airport cities and aerotropolises and this integration. In, in, in Africa, but we see it in the Middle East and in Lebanon, and we see it uh, in Asia, of course, and in America, I mean, Northern America, where it, was, um, where it was invented without the intention actually to invent it, it just happened. And they, they, they were teaching us the lesson. Yeah, from Russia to China. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, China is in a very fast developing market, yeah, so uh, it's the same discussion we have uh, in, in China, how many people get a passport and are able to, to effort in a flight, especially to Europe, but uh, at first for the Chinese is America. So, and uh, we are looking for a tremendous development of, of the Chinese airlines. It's combined with the policy of the, uh, of the government not to uh, conduct the, the airline industry centralized. They're going more and more in the space, the special areas. You can see a lot of uh, Chinese airlines are growing, and that's a uh, very, very uh, difficult situation as well. What I would say if I had to find an, uh, found an, an airline, I think it's very, very important is to decide a legacy airline or a low-cost area uh, airline. I think a lot of uh, airlines in Europe, and we can see. I'm from Berlin. Yeah, you can see it with the uh, Air Berlin. If you try to transform later on a legacy air, uh, airline to a low-cost carrier, that's not working. So when you're starting to find an, an, an airline model, you have to think twice and three times about the business model, low-cost or legacy. That's important. Peter, what would you do with your money? <laughs> well, for me, it's uh, very clearly Asia. I'd be building an airport in Asia. Um, I think that the potential for Asia is still phenomenal. So we've seen phenomenal growth already. We've seen um, the population pick up the potential of travel in a, an extraordinary way. And I think we're only just scratching the surface of that. I'd want to take advantage of the China market, but I wouldn't do it in China. There are too many restrictions, pitfalls, opaque elements that would make it hard. But in Asia, it's not always clear and obvious, but the market potential is there. The level of competition is not as tough as it is here in, uh, in Europe. So I'd build that airport in Asia, I'd take advantage of the China market, I would want to make sure that I do facilitate long haul as well as short haul. So your location needs to be to be able to tap both of that. The short haul um, travel by the Asian market linking through into Europe and potentially the States, but in particular Europe. Thank you. Can I just go back to Kai for a moment? Because you at Bauhaus Luftfahrt, you have done this study about what if airlines, instead of owning all of their own, were using other aircraft. 
What are your main findings, conclusions from this? Okay, before I answer the question, maybe let's say a few words about, about the concept. So um, we started probably two years ago thinking about, okay, sharing economy as a kind of buzzword. Uh, what does it mean also for aviation? And then we also compared what are other mobility providers uh, doing. And then we looked at, for example, like Car2Go or DriveNow. So that uh, you have, let's say, cars, they are, they are on demand, maybe they are free floating or you have a kind of station based. Um, approach like a six or Europe car so and then we thought okay does it make sense to apply this kind of concept to aviation um, we did the first studies um, using um, scheduled flight data so we're not touching any let's say problems of changing the slots and the slot distribution of, of, uh, of airlines at the airport um, and the outcome is um, yeah, a huge potential um, mm -hmm. roughly roughly 20% uh, of aircraft you can save so if you look at um, list price, and for sure, let's say no airline is uh, paying the list price of an aircraft, but if you take the list price, we're talking about 200 billion uh, US dollars you can save. So from that perspective, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very promising. Um, yeah, and also you have to think about, I mean, today in the morning, I heard um, from Batati and also from Marco um, that the key assets in the future of an airline is not longer um, the, the physical assets, it's the digital one. So that means also what is the, the future value um, of, of an airline. So with this concept, uh, we, are, we are definitely looking at uh, short haul operations. So we're just transporting passengers from A to B. Um, where it's also much less cabin flexibility or in terms of layout you have there. So, um, yeah, it's promising. And also keeping in mind that roughly today 40% of the aircraft are leased. So, they're, I mean, they're, let's say, purchased and distributed, uh, not by the airline, some, by somebody else. So if you all take these things, um, yeah, um, interesting, let's say, interesting concept um, and not so far away from uh, realization. I liked Kai's original answer to your question because he's the only one in this panel who did not choose to do what he already did. Stefan, airliner, does an airline. <laughs> Daniel, airport guy, does an airport, and so on and so forth. Um, during the whole day today, there were so many interesting uh, little details being mentioned. In the last uh, conversation that you had here on stage, uh, for example, about sharing the data, what I was missing was a clear uh, statement or, or even demand. Airlines and airports share the data, you share the passenger. Um, I, see, I worked on both sides, but it actually shouldn't be two sides. It should be one side because we have one common aim. And this is to make sure that people get from A to B and to C and that we earn good money from this. This is our aim, and um, when I'm, I'm on, uh, on, 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 on uh, the, the, the boards, uh, the Europe boards and the World Governing Board of Airport Council International, which has been mentioned before, I mean, ACI has been mentioned before, and then um, many people don't know this, and they say, what is this? And then a common explanation would be, you know, the airlines, they have IATA, this is their club, and the airports, they have ACI, this is their club. And there's the problem already. Um, and then I hear then things like the airport charges initiative now in the European Union that uh, airport charges should be regulated. Why do we need somebody from the outside to regulate our business? Who is regulating uh, the content of Pepsi Cola and how much they can charge in which market for one liter of this brown stuff? Nobody would ever do that. Just in our industry and this is the industry is divided which is a great pity and this is why we have not none of us has chosen you will went into this direction right? but none of us has chosen say okay let's see how how big of an airport is a base for how big of an airline can we do with this one billion that you are so generous to give to us so. <laughs> <laughs> just to pick up on the point about the digitalization and having that data um, I, I think it's so important, and all of the low-cost airlines that I've been involved with, that's one of the things that I come in and talk about. Now, let's put it in perspective. Ryanair, Ryanair Labs is part of Ryanair, with 400 people working in Dublin, 160 working in Poland, with another 250 down in Madrid. And every one of them are Java experts, computer experts, data analysts, air experts, so they're creating that capability. 
So all you're reading about with always getting better is coming out of that. And O'Leary was quoted in a recent event which I was at. He said, someday is coming where Ryanair, the airline, will be a customer of Ryanair Labs because everything is going to come from the labs. And you're beginning to see that. I mean, things like the guarantee on price. If you can find a cheaper price on any other airline, you will get a refund and five euros into your My Ryanair account. And now 40 million people have signed up for My Ryanair and have all the records and all the data is held and controlled by Ryanair. They're not giving it to third parties. Peach, the one I'm working in Japan, scale is totally different, much smaller scale, five, five million passengers <coughs> with them. Um, 23 aircraft, so different scale. So we are outsourcing, but we're controlling the data. And the first thing we had to do to bring that in was to find people who would have competence and capability to do that. And they were not airline people. So the top three people in the commercial division in Peach are coming from consumer background. They're in marketing people, they're retailers, they're job experts, they're IT experts. And they drive the whole commercial effort that's going on at Peach, because I think what's been said is right, and it's happening, and it's happening today. And in the case of Peach, we want to be the leader in that particular field, but we, we can do it. And we can do it now. Back to the other thing about investment, the one billion. You don't need that anymore, because the leasing capability enables you to do the leasing. And you can have that money reinvested in other things that will drive the revenue flow into that airline. And the leasing is just a cost of running the business. So it's a whole change scene that's taken place in the past five years, and that's one of the fundamentals of it. And the big carriers, there are some that are doing it, but most are not. They're way behind in terms of digitalization, data-driven marketing. That's not happening yet, but it will in time. Maybe it's the best to, to align airlines and airports. Why not you have your own airline? Yeah. At a capital airport or like Hainan, is that uh, have you got the the difficulty to share data or do you have a better relationship, let's say, between airports and airlines in in China, not being well competitors who is owning the passenger? Uh, so uh, the development in in China is so fast that we as Hainan Airlines decided to keep the quality we are expecting from the airport to build our own airport or to buy our own airport. What means data? It's general, another discussion about China. Yeah. Data in or from China, using internet and so on, it's a very, very sensitive issue. Yeah. And that's generally, today we was talking about sharing information, data and, and so on. And I had always the, the feeling, everybody is speaking about one world. We are not one world, especially what means information. Yeah, so uh, you have uh, a lot of limits and, uh, and re reductions and rules and, and, and so on. We have to follow. So it is very, very difficult to talk about this and to, to say, okay, we built up this and this standards and so on and everybody should follow. No, in, in a lot of countries, especially in China, it is not not the truth, and I don't think so that in the next future it will be happen. Very, I love this. <laughs> Are you coming for the dinner tonight? We have a lot to talk about. We have a lot to talk about. Just, just to add to that, I think far more important is the creating of a competitive environment at airports. Yeah. And that's far more important. If, if Hainan owns the airport, I'm not going there. <laughs> because I won't get a lot of screwed. At some time, I might get a deal first off. The best thing has happened, privatization of airports, open competition to get the ownership and control of that airport, and the regulation of the prices that charge the airlines. They can do all they want on the commercial side, build the land, and build the offices, and build the other sources. But the charges to airports are out of control, and it's been blamed on, and it's because of regulatory situation. That's got to change. But if you privatize the airport, then the airport must be profitable. And uh, with the airlines not wanting to pay, but actually wanting to get ideally money for every passenger, they either we start sharing the data so that we can make money from this passenger on the airport side, and then subsidize the startup of new routes of the airline, um, or the airline has to pay for the services that are rendered to their to their passengers. And there might again be not one solution that is globally to be applied, just following. Uh, Stefan's statement, because 
uh, what, what I noted down today is that globalization, internet, international uh, global solutions, systems, etc. Um, but we also heard about today, uh, we also heard today about um, uh, localization of products that are being sold in food and beverage in airports, for example. There we want localization. We heard about the Amazon Go shop in Seattle. I mean, this is wonderful, isn't it? Amazon makes a shop with real people in it. A shop you can walk into. I mean, it took them 15 years to destroy most of these shops, and now they are making... They're, they're inventing, reinventing it. It's great. But there was mentioned the, the cameras in the ceiling. And of course, I mean, I'm from Germany originally. Um, in Germany, it, it's a nightmare. If a city puts up a camera on the central square, there would be a demonstration by the Green Party and the left and the ultra-rights tomorrow. All together, united, they would march. Yeah? And um, in, in Tel Aviv, if the government would remove the cameras from the public, um, from the public uh, streets and, and, and squares with uh, face recognition ca uh, capability, there would be demonstrations by the public because the government is removing the safety from the, from, from the squares. Yeah? Or um, in, in, in Europe, you would never pay a, a traffic ticket if your, your face is not clearly shown in the picture the one who's driving the car too fast you know, must be identified because he's the guilty one. In Russia, you must not pay the ticket if the face is visible, <laughs> yeah? because um, you could sit with the wrong person on the co-pilot seat in this car, yeah? and uh, the wife then would recognize who was in the car. So you, you can ignore such a ticket in Russia. You only pay the ticket when there is only the number plate readable, and you see, it's a cultural difference and we have a cultural difference also I come in, when it comes to ownership um, in, in China is a little bit more like Russia in certain things and, and, and the states are similar to some of the countries in Asia in certain things and also in terms of ownership and who's charging whom for what and who provides which services and uh, I think if an airline is not sure they get the best service by the local service providers in the airports, and then they build their own airport. And what you were referring to, I saw presentations on this, is not only an airport, it's an airport with an aerotropolis around, which looks pretty fancy, and I think that's fair. But in other markets, different approach. It was great to hear your comment there, um, Patrick, about um, privatization of airports. Um, that uh, it drives, in my experience, improved airline relationships, and I see that in my relatively short time in Scandinavia now, that we are the only privatized airport in, uh, in Sweden, and we have a very close collaborative relationship with our airline customers. And we make money as a business, a modest amount, but we are effective in our business, and it's a two-way street. And I saw that in Sydney in my early days where we were a government organization sold to a very um, proactive set of owners and it was all about how do we work together with the airlines and that is fundamental and it's got to come from the top and it's got to be a genuine two-way partnership and it works and the airport makes money and the airlines make money. Just out of piece, in Japan we're getting the privatization of all the Japanese airports. Mm -hmm. The main base for Peach is in Osaka and that was privatized uh, and it was bought by the French company Vinci. Uh, Moshi, and uh, they have a, but the relationship is now brilliant. We have a dedicated low cost terminal, 17 gates uh, that work very efficiently. There's no jetways, there's no high cost marble or anything else going into the whole process. And we even have a shop in Kansai Airport. That's to say, Peach has the shop as well as all the other people doing the supplies, but Peach has its own shop, so it can sell its own products inside the main base for that airline. Shall we see if there are questions to the panel? Patati was first, yeah. Very good. Five euro for you in the Ryanair <laughs> account. <laughs> Towards. <laughs> Towards <ever. laughs> uh, so my question is actually for Patrick. So someone as sophisticated as Ryanair, why has data-driven marketing not happened yet? So what are the roadblocks? Oh, data-driven marketing is happening at a hell of a pace at the moment but it's really three or four years in business. There are 800 people now working on it, but four years ago, there was zero people. It 
was not considered a worthwhile venture. Price was the only thing that mattered. That's all it was at then. And the whole effort was driven by price, but in the past. But the recognition has taken place now that unless you're data-driven in terms of what you're doing, unless you know your customers and you can predict what they're going to do, unless you can organize things and give them all that they want uh, to drive that revenue, and it's not just the seat on the airplane, but it's the whole bunch of other retail things that an airline can do and should do, and Ryanair is proving it and doing it. Some other airlines are chasing and doing it. And frankly, in Japan again, with the one I'm working with, the Bowen, it's important. But in Latin America, we did exactly the same. It's critical. Thank you. More questions? I have got one. You have got one? Yeah. Do you want to go ahead? Yes, because I, I was wondering, um, Patrick, I was listening to you, and you said when, when we were talking about long-haul low cost, you said, oh, it's bad business, and it seems you were burning your billion there, and you didn't want to. And in the end, you said, well, the 737 MAX and the A321 long range can fly for eight hours. So it, that seems to be long range. Maybe okay. not in Japan, but in Germany, eight hours is long range. <laughs> Let me put eight hours in the context of fact. <laughs> eight hours from Japan will cover Bangkok, uh, Singapore, uh, Jakarta, Kuala Lumpur, uh, Bali, and all of those places, which are out of range today. Current A320 and 737 have a range of four, four and a half hours. Now, if you go over that, you're affecting payload. And some of the Ryanair long haul flights are already payload and restricted. And certainly some of the Norwegian flights to America are not passenger constrained mm -hmm. because you cannot carry those passengers. But the new aircraft that are coming out only create that capability. So you'll have a 189 seater Boeing 737 or a 240-seater L321. But we don't know yet the rate of fuel consumption and various other things and how much saving you can make. But I think it's fairly predictable that you will. Now, long haul is more than seven hours, and that's where you get into it. Now, let me use the, I'll use the empirical data of Nor Norwegian. Um, there have been a number of studies that have done on this here. If you do a long haul operation, you're going to be lower cost than the traditional airlines, no question about it. How much lower? As much as 20 to 40 percent lower than the, than the established airlines, which is significant. Now, the advantage in the short haul is much greater. The, the, low-cost airlines can get 40%, 50% less than the established airlines. But the difference comes when you come to revenue per available seat kilometer. And when you do that, you're at a disadvantage because the established carriers all have the first class, the business class, and the premium economy, and relatively high economy fares, and can price accordingly. So they are cross-subsidizing the whole operation. So the effective relative performance is that the low-cost airlines will not get more than a 10 or 15% advantage mm -hmm. in the total operating costs. So the margins for full service airline, or traditional airline, should be 14 to 15%. Most are doing that or thereabouts. But the Norwegian one is 3 to 5%. Now you're taking some risk when you're only at 3 to 5%. And that's why you wouldn't touch it at the moment. But these new aircraft give the capability of possibly pushing that a lot further. Still mm -hmm. wait, the jury's out. We don't know, but it's not proven. But that's the, the big difference. Peter, what's your idea in Scandinavia at the moment um, concerning long-haul operation and low cost? You, you have, the, not at your airport, but the A340-787 of Norwegian are not too far away. Yeah. Uh, what, what is the overall impression? And also go to Daniel, the question, are you at Moscow Domodedovo, are you looking at carriers for long-haul operation in the low cost business? Or is Russia low cost already? You first, and then Daniel. Well, I mean, we're very fortunate by having um, Norwegian in our region, and they have transformed um, into uh, a business model that was quite unique. I remember when they first went to Dubai from um, um, was it Oslo or, um, or Stockholm uh, many years ago, and that was transforming for that region, and I was in Abu Dhabi at the, at the time. And they were very clear on how they would make money, um, there were issues with some payload, in particularly in the northbound, but they've picked markets that were poorly served by the legacy carriers. So as you mentioned, A340, 300s for SAS operating into some markets, there's no way they would make money. 
But as soon as the new generation aircraft have come online with the 787s and the A350s, it's opened up marginal markets. And for the Scandinavian market, which is relatively small, it's transformative. Um, Scandinavia is also a great point of entry into Europe from Asia, and that's been facilitated dramatically by uh, the new generation aircraft, and it makes a difference for, um, for our region. Very positive. Very positive. Daniel? First of all, we, are, we welcome any airline that would fly to us, including long-haul, low-cost. However, the Russian market was famous for and is becoming known again for this big difference in, in, in customer wish. We have a very strong um, um, customer group for premium travel and we have a very strong customer group in Russia in general for extremely low cost travel. And this is why almost all Russian carriers have a fixed business class and, uh, and, a, and a huge economy class because what was lost in the European market over the last 25 years, this very strong premium segment even on short haul and of course on long haul routes is in Russia still existing. Russians work uh, extremely hard, uh, they celebrate extremely hard and when they go on holidays or travel then this is always an element of celebration in it and uh, suddenly they spend all they have just to have a great time and a great product if they can afford. And this is why um, I think, uh, I know that a, a long-haul low-coster will be successful flying to and from Russia, but somebody who adds three, four rows of fixed business class into the cabin or first class will be as successful and just get more money into the pocket. The same in China? Um, absolutely. Um, in China, I, I think it's the development uh, much more faster than in Russia. Um, we have the element of, of proudness to fly business classes, not only to, to use the service, no, to show the family I got it in my life. And I understand right now, well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Prestige. Yeah. And for us as an airline, it's very, very difficult because so we, we are developing a market. We are developing a new kind of passenger, yeah? For example, the language. The, the, the Chinese don't speak English, yeah? Uh, the, the Russian either, <laughs> yeah? So, so uh, and they are uh, upcoming, not willing to, uh, to learn English or something like this. No, they expect we are so much, and we are spending so much money, we expect that you are speaking Chinese, yeah? Uh, and, and so, we are, we are looking in the future, and we cannot, or it, it would be a mistake if we are saying, okay, in Europe is running like this and this and this business class service and economy class service and low-cost carrier and adapt it to, to the Chinese. That's wrong. That will, will be failure. Yeah. So uh, we as a Chinese airline with, with five-star star status, we have to think more or less every day about this, what, what the Chinese expect in the next year for us. But what makes you so successful, Stefan? Because what I have noticed in our discussion, we still talk a lot about the known business models. But somehow, also during the day, I think we said, will even Ryanair, the way we know it, will they really still be successful in this way? And they are actually working on a lot of changes because they know they won't. And at the moment, the stock market, in spite of high profits, don't believe yet in that this strategy will succeed. Hainan Airlines as a business model is, you wouldn't call it long haul low cost, but it probably has quite efficient prices from the customer perspective. Mm -hmm. Hainan Airlines is very successful. What makes it so successful? What are they not doing um, that others do who don't succeed? What, what helps? And I think there is a big share of Chinese um, customers for them. So can you elaborate on that at, a bit more? At first it's true, yeah. Our passengers, 80% of our passengers are Chinese, mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, that's not that the German passengers or European passengers are not welcome. The demand is so high that we are flying Chinese passengers at first. Um, successful, that's what I said uh, before, because we are running really a fully policy 
not to be a low-cost carrier or not to be touched as a low-cost carrier. Sometimes we have the situation that our competitor is coming on the market with lower fares, and we are saying with purpose, no, that's not our fare. Yeah? For a good product, everybody should be willing to pay a good price. Yeah? So, and I think this these as, a, as a general model for the long-distance flights, not for, for inner... In a Chinese, it's a completely different uh, product. But for the long distance flights, to have these expectations or give these expectations to the passenger, I, I think it's, it's basic of, of success. Yeah, not to jump between and a little bit half and so on, and coming with coast cutting and, and so on, reducing the service sometimes with hand, hand luggage, sometimes without hand luggage and, and so on. That's make, mixing up, up the passengers, and at the end, the image of the, the reputation of the airline will lose. So, it, just to, to say, and, and supporting this, there is a fundamental change. We talked about models, right? It, it, just pay attention to that. In uh, Asia, we've already had ANA now owns Peach. It also owns Vanilla, but it also has its traditional full-service airline. Mm -hmm. So it separates it. It's reducing its domestic operation and pushing the low-cost airlines in there because that's where the demand is and that's where the, the way they deliver it. And they're doing that. But it's not alone. You have to remember that Singapore Airlines owns Scoot and did own Tiger Air, which they have merged, but they're differentiating their product, right? Uh, and you also have in Qantas owns Jetstar, same phenomena. Now we're having it in Europe. Lufthansa owns Eurowings yeah. and Eurowings is not a full, ultra low cost, but is a different cost structure than the existing Lufthansa. Air France have set up June, and they're going long haul starting in May, <laughs> right? Uh, Brazier is on level, as well as Boeing, <laughs> and the level is going to operate not just from Barcelona, but also from Paris, and probably from Rome, and they're setting up a different. So they're recognizing there is a difference, and I've said it here this morning, some other occasion. I think I'm beginning to see this concept of a branding concept that you differentiate with the brand name and you differentiate the product to do with that and your pricing is totally different when you do that. But they operate independently. But with the brands, why do the aircraft need to be different? Is that not the old thinking? Because at the moment all the systems, all the thinking is actually I divide my aircraft into the cabins which the old legacy systems provide. I think about business class, then I, okay, premium economy um, airlines realize, then I have economy. Why does the aircraft, why can the aircraft not have as many seats, as many uh, different classes as there are seats? And when we talk about digitization, why can the customer not, if already choosing everything digital, really develop their own product? And then actually you can maybe have different brands to market that, but in, within those aircraft, could that be one of the, well, the, aircraft, the ideas? The aircraft are different, no, no matter what you say, right across the whole of Europe. An Airbus A320 operating pretty well on EasyJet, on, on uh, Ryanair, or uh, Wiz. Uh, uh, one, two, uh, 189 seats, are, right? Whereas the standard for most of the other operators is 150 to 160 seats. And on the long haul, the 787s, I can't remember precisely the numbers, but there's quite a big difference. The advantages for the low cost airline in the long haul is the number of seats. But that would be unacceptable to a lot of the passengers that would traditionally go with that full service airline, right? How many people here travel on a full service airline and get a cramped <laughs> position and said, never again, if we can avoid it. So I do think that you have the, the differentiation and that you're going to find this movement um, and counterbalance, but mainly trying to create the full service airline as a differentiator, higher quality product. Let's put it as, as simple as that. But defining that is different from each airline. <clears throat> but your idea would mean a different product on board then? For exactly. The different why, why can the customer not choose what they want? Everything is because digital. Because it adds complexity to the whole thing, and this is cost again. In today's world, the way that everything is set up. So if we now really think about what we would do, or what could be possible, what could succeed, maybe we have to get away a little bit more from what we know from today's world. That's Kai, do you think out of the box? I, I, it seems uh, something works in your in your head. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, sh sure, we, we're looking at these things, but I mean, then also thinking about, I mean, it's just about research and dreaming of what might be. I mean, 
Um, there are certain, let's say, industry principles you have to think about. So if you think about, okay, you want to adapt your cabin to, to, to a certain, let's say, demand of the, of the, of the passengers, uh, how often you would like to change that? Is it uh, once throughout seven years? I mean, then it's easy if you want to do that if, uh, after uh, every flight. I mean, you have to have, let's say, a certain yeah, complexity, for example, um, I remember it probably 10 years ago or something like that, there was a kind of flexible seats concept from Lufthansa, mm -hmm. where you can change from three seats uh, to two seats. Um, yeah, it, first of all, I mean, the cabin crew has to, to, to do the modification, um, it's, it's more heavy, um, yeah, you have to maintain that and so I on. I would buy the seats on the aircraft that you are leasing out. Instead yeah. of, so for the different products, yeah. instead I, of owning all yeah. of these aircraft I, and making it complicated. Yeah. I mean, in, in, that respect, <laughs> in that respect, I would say this is, let's say, maybe not, not, a, not, a, not a clever way to do. The other thing is, I mean, there are also so many um, concepts probably 20, 30 years ago that you have a kind of module air, uh, cabin that you push out of the aircraft uh, at, a, at an airport and you change the, the, the cabin and putting some other modules like resting modules or sleeping modules or dining modules. So if you go that route, for example, you're adding so much complexity in terms of at the airport because you have to store the modules and so on. So um, this is also, let's say, not, not from my point of view a clever way to go. So coming back, let's say, to, to the idea that the, that the aircraft is, is shared amongst the different airlines, it means that, okay, I have this kind of, let's say, um, customers, uh, they want to fly um, or they want to see such a cabin. So I can pick, let's say, between... 20, 30, 40 different, let's say, A320 or 737s, um, which are, let's say, at a typical hub airports, and one of them might, let's say, fit at, at the best, so to say, in terms of um, serving the demand. So I would say this might be, let's say, one of the clever things we can see how to more customize um, um, the, the cabin or, let's say, the environment. Um, that um, the asset is not longer fixed, let's say, to, to an airline, so you have a kind of um, maybe an S class or a five series and a three series and so mm -hmm. on. And then you pick, okay, I just want to drive this or fly this time a seven series or, um, or a Dacia or, or whatever. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hyperloop. <laughs> yeah, I mean, then you have to do some clever branding to put, let's say, uh, some, some logos uh, to there, uh, let's say, to the surfaces, uh, maybe some, some color scheme uh, in the. No. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> One point I, I want to bring into the discussion, our experience w uh, with collecting data about the passengers means at first um, that the reservation and the ticketing is running via the internet. That's the easiest way for us to, to get the, uh, the information. Um, collecting uh, passenger, additional passenger information from the travel agency is more and more blocked. Mm -hmm. The travel agency don't or try to block uh, to hand over the, the information to the, to the airlines. They fear that we are using the, uh, the especially for frequent flyer programs. Yeah, a lot of companies uh, give informations of the passengers not to the airlines or to the service provider. It's just that you get the information about the uh, uh, TMCs, the the, the offices uh, they are booking. Yeah. In Germany, in general, we, we have a uh, portion of nearly 50% of tickets are coming via the internet. All the others coming via the travel agencies. Yeah. So I see from our perspective a big problem to collect the information. When we, are, we try to, to, uh, to react for the demand of the passengers, we need the information about the passengers. Without the information, uh, we are make a calculation of nothing. Yeah? So, and it's, especially in Germany, it's very, very difficult to collect this information. In Scandinavia, it's completely different. For example, you have 80% or nearly 90% of the passengers make the reservations and ticketing via the internet. In China, it is nearly by 20% as well. It's going via the travel agency. They like WeChat and, and so on and electronics, but at the end, if they are paying 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 euro for a flight to Europe, they trust at first the papers. Yeah. It's not wrong. <laughs> <laughs>
I trust papers too. <laughs> Shall we see, are there still any questions from your side? Yes, Timon. We need some voice for Timon. Hello, hello. Yes. Here we are. Um, I like the um, challenge of this um, shared economy approach to the, uh, to the aircraft. And Patrick, you said you observe a lot of brand differentiation, even though owned by the same company, um, which is a fact. I mean, uh, Peach and ANI, there are other examples. Um, so you cannot just mix the, mix the passenger and take that opportunity. Um, I would think so um, that you can one way, not the other way around. You cannot downgrade a premium, uh, or not even a premium fly, you cannot downgrade a full service brand loyal customer to, to an aircraft of, of Peach maybe, but you could upgrade him if that makes sense and um, better utilize um, um, capacities, right? No, I mean, you, you remember that. he has to say that yeah. she disagrees. <laughs> yeah, I, I completely disagree. That would be the equivalent of saying that Uber can position its black product to compete with Black Lane. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you, have, you have dinner together, Patrick? <laughs> the, most, the most important thing is the low cost here con collectively are operating at 90% plus load factor all of the time, right? all of the time, including the winter, because they use price to drive demand, right? And that's working all the time. Now, you obviously select the routes that you think will, will work, but that's the key, and keep the load factor so high that there's no question of having space or moving people up. There's the next flight, there's four flights a day, there's any number of possibilities, but the differentiation, I think, is terribly important. So I know the ANA approach, because I'm involved with them, is to keep it totally different. May even go to second other airports, <laughs> you know, even serving the same destination. They will do things like that, but not integrate the product. You, you have such uh, examples. Uh, Aeroflot has a subsidiary called Pabieda, which is an ultra low cost carrier in the Russian sense of the meaning. And they so far didn't want them to operate from the same Moscow airport. They have, they're operating in separate airports. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Aeroflot slash um, Rossiya flights, which used to be Pukovo Airlines, that operated to Vnukovo Airport, where this ultra-low-cost carrier is operating from. Um, they are now being moved to the Sheremetyevo Airport in order to even, to, to, to even widen the gap between the two products, physical gap, two hours in between the two airports, so that the pa that completely different passengers, no, no, no interlining, no uh, transit product, nothing like this. So fully supported. Your idea. You, you, you're not consulting those guys, Patrick? <laughs> no, but, but, but let me say, it's going the reverse way. Ryanair this year will now uh, allow connecting traffic. What? This has never been done before. Ryanair has now created um, an interline arrangement at Milano, at Rome, and at Porto. And at Madrid, they're now feeding into Air, Europe, Air Europa for all the Latin America, 16 long-haul operations. And I will not let you into a secret, it's pretty well public knowledge, there will be an interline deal at Dublin Airport sometime this year. <coughs> so there's a, the change is taking place. And then we're going to have the mix of different airlines, different services, but there will be with different airlines. One of the biggest problems for Jetstar today, Jetstar is a Qantas and they code share. So people are going out for a Qantas flight and they put on a Jetstar and they said, this is not what I paid for. <laughs> And that's not good enough. So they're having that differentiation problem. So I think differentiate, keep the product separate, keep the brand name separate, and go from there. And there will be more and more opportunities for different kinds of brands in the future. I think we should continue the discussion in the course of the evening with maybe a nice glass of wine and something to eat. And uh, so I maybe will just First of all, thank all of you for participating, but please bear with us for a moment just to tell, tell you. <laughs> Let us just announce some of the practical stuff. So, 
first of all, Slack. Please spend two seconds on Slack because there is, like, you just need to click from one to ten to give an evaluation of the day, um, which would be very much appreciated. Um, then we will have, there are people who booked the guided tour in the museum. And uh, if you want to walk across jointly, so the Maritime Museum is really, it's a five minutes walk away, then um, please meet in the lobby at 20 to 7, so 1840. And there are Francesca and Paolo who will join you um, to the museum. So. Um, if you want to go on your own, make your way on your own, but the guided tour starts at 1900, so please ensure that you are there. And also for those people who registered for the dinner, it starts at 1930. We do meet, we have people from the team um, walking over with you if you want to walk over jointly or you are not exactly sure where it is. Um, so it's from 1915 up to 1930, 1935 to walk over together, or you can make your own way to the museum. And um, then we have just uh, very briefly for tomorrow morning, we start at 7.45, similar to this morning, with coffee. Um, and then we start with a dial-in from Antalya with the CEO of Sun Express at 8.30 tomorrow morning. So, um, did I forget anything, Cord? I think it was important for me because I need to wake up at 6 now. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy your evening, relax, a big, big thank you to you. And uh, we look forward to continue thinking future and having those discussions during the evening. Thank you very much.